A very powerful aircraft. A very powerful aircraft. Now, I mean, any aircraft in those days that could carry a 10 ton bomb was an aircraft to be reckoned with. The opportunity to, to uh, indulge in low flying, authorised low flying, was a real boon to most pilots who enjoy low flying. It was noisy, it was sometimes smelly. Um, but the bomb aims compartment was probably the most comfortable place in the aircraft. But it was such a bloody reliable aeroplane. We never had any doubt about the aeroplane bringing us back, provided it didn't get shot up or whatever. Flying along, looking down at this black velvet Europe underneath us, with occasional little light, occasional search right over there. And I used to think to myself, oh my God, just imagine having to go down there. Uh, just imagine trying to avoid capture. Just imagine starving. It was, um, it looked good and it certainly flew well. By January 1941, German domination of Europe was virtually complete. The battles of the West were over, and although the Luftwaffe had failed to secure the invasion of Britain in the summer of 1940, the island's survival hung by a slender thread. Since the autumn of 1940, British cities reeled under the onslaught of the Blitz. Night after night, the drone of approaching enemy aircraft brought yet more destruction and horror. On May the 11th, 1941, London shook as 550 German bombers launched the biggest raid to date. By the time the early light of dawn found its way through the dust, some 1,400 civilians had been killed. People began to wonder how much longer London could endure such punishment. Tens of thousands of British workers were homeless. This was the dawn of a new type of warfare in which British factories and workers were pitted against their German counterparts. The men and women who are working on the assembly lines of British, Russian, Chinese and American factories these uh, production soldiers know that this is, in truth and reality, a war between the factories. And now, in 1943, our production soldiers are moving to the offensive. Giant bombers like these massive Lancasters are rolling off our production line. In a war between the factories, the winner will be those who are able to carry the greatest weight of bombs and drop them on the enemy. Thus, and thus alone, will the air power of the United Nations bring that increasing volume of attack against the enemy, which will help us bring the war to a happy conclusion. Britain's war effort was further damaged by the attacks on British shipping. Britain may have won the Battle of Britain, but wars are seldom won by successful defence, and yet it seems she had little means of taking the fight to Germany. RAF Bomber Command had been mounting raids from the very first days of the war, but resources were stretched. At best, Bomber Command could only send out small groups of bombers under the cover of night without escort or radio beams to help them find their targets. Much of this work fell to crews flying twin-engined Wellingtons. The aircraft was strong and could withstand a lot of battle damage, 
but its payload of four and a half thousand pounds was inadequate for a sustained bombing campaign. Night after night, the crews would assemble for their briefings. They would learn what their targets were, bomb loads and weather, although the latter was more often than not based on educated guesswork. The crews would do their best, but they knew that darkness, ice, cloud and enemy defences would conspire to make their efforts a waste of time and resources, and worse, the lives of the crews who got shot down. Morale took a further knock, however, when a report revealed that the bombers were missing their targets. Yes, it's deadening, really. You knew that um, you were perhaps uh, close to the target because you'd, you'd navigated as best you could, but um, you knew that uh, within five miles or so you were hopeless. And in fact, um, the most damage we did to the German war effort was killing their cows in the fields. But if 1941 was a low point of the war so far, things could only get better. And they were about to. There was no shortage of young men wanting to join Bomber Command. Training of air crew in the United States and Canada helped reduce the long waiting times that many new recruits had experienced at the beginning of the war. I certainly wanted to fly. I did have a choice, fortunately, because I might have gone into the army, but um, I volunteered well ahead of conscription, although they didn't call me up for a long time. I volunteered, I think, originally at about um, the end of 39, but I didn't go in for nearly a year, like a lot of other chaps, of course. Well, I think it was a combination of two circumstances. The RAF was expanding very rapidly, and they were hungry for air crews. The Navy had lost courageous, glorious... Um, illustrious had been, had been under repair um, and um, Ark Royal had been lost and all the new carriers hadn't implacable, indefatigable, hadn't come on stream and so there was probably a surplus of naval observers at that time. I've often asked myself that question and why it took so long because uh, losses were pretty heavy in 1941, 40 and 41 and even the beginning of 42 and I find it rather surprising that it took me 18 months to reach operations. Despite the rapid expansion, crews generally chose each other rather than be assigned. You went into a huge room, I'm not sure if it was in there, not a hangar, but a huge room, and you looked at somebody and thought, hmm, he looks like he might be a good chap. And if somebody else didn't grab him first, you did. But somehow, we all seemed to end up with the crews that we really liked afterwards, we trusted. Clearly on operations, you, you, your life is in everybody else's hands and their lives are in your hands. So there's an enormous amount of crew cooperation and, and loyalty, yes. Yeah, I think it's important that uh, a crew uh, uh, operates as a unit, they, they uh, fly as a unit, they, uh, they trust each other uh, and uh, develop a, a spirit of camaraderie between the crew I think is important. Uh, to me as a captain, or was important as, to me as a captain, and also for successful, completing successful operations. What makes a good crew? Primarily the pilot. And we had such confidence in Joe as a crew that it, it welded the crew together. Um, we all gave him the best we could, did our jobs as best we could. We trusted each other implicitly. We had to. If you didn't trust somebody on your crew, you shouldn't be flying with them. Although Bomber Command was getting the recruits, it still needed aircraft to do the job. If the RAF was going to mount a sustained and effective bombing campaign, it would need bigger aircraft that would carry more bombs further. In August 1940, just as the Blitz was beginning, Bomber Command began receiving the first of its four-engine heavy bombers, the Short Sterling. When I first saw it and looked up to the cockpit, it was about, I think they're about 27 feet off the ground. Um, I thought, that looks a bit of a challenge, yes. It was like a, a ship inside, which you had huge wheels for fuel tanks, you couldn't do it yourself. The flight engineer had to go back to the middle of the aircraft and turn these wheels around. But then it was built by Schwartz of Belfast, who just built, usually built ships. Um, once inside, you got onto the flight deck, which was 
really a, it was really capacious. You looked around and thought, rather well, like the bridge of a ship. But once you were there and everybody was in place, you were flying an aeroplane. It was more difficult on the ground, actually, for taxiing than it was in the air. Once in the air, it was fine. It was a good aeroplane. Just as the Stirling was beginning operations in early 1941, another even more powerful aircraft was about to join the fray. The Avro Lancaster was an aircraft that would play a significant role in the final outcome of the war. The Lancaster began life as the Avro Manchester, which first flew in July 1939. Designed by Roy Chadwick, the Manchester was conceived as a medium bomber, powered by two Rolls-Royce Vulture engines. Chadwick, he was a man, I can explain to you, he was a certain guy that he'd always got time for you and he'd always listen to you. If you you know, if there was a problem, he'd come and ex, you know, he'd explain it to him and this, that and the other. We were very fortunate in those days and we had a, a management team second to none. I mean, we had Chadwick, the chief designer, we got Sir Roy Dobson. <coughs> so again, he was another engineer. We'd got Jimmy Kay, he was another engineer. Um, Teddy Fielding, he was a great production man, you know, no doubt about it. What he said on production went. And uh, they all knew the job and they weren't frightened of taking the coats off and having a go with you. Some 1,200 aircraft were ordered but only 200 were actually delivered due to the engine's unreliability and the Manchester's performance. For example, its operating altitude was between 10 and 15,000 feet, which meant it was vulnerable to flak. The problem was that um, the engines weren't all that dependable at the, at the time. They had a lot of big end trouble. And uh, strangely enough, towards the end of the war, the conversion units were doing most of their flying on the Manchester with only a few circuits on the Lancaster to, to uh, uh, fit them for their squadron postings. But um, the problem was that uh, the Manchester wouldn't maintain height on one engine. So if you lost an engine, uh, if you could maintain height and keep the oil temperature down um, without opening the oil uh, temperature control, then it would maintain height and you could get back. But um, if for some reason the operating engine began to overheat and you inched the oil cooler flap open, then for some aerodynamic reason, the aircraft would begin to lose height. And uh, um, not many people got back uh, from long distances on one engine. Early in 1940, there were discussions regarding proposals for a Manchester 3, powered by four Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, which were proving very successful in Spitfires and Hurricanes. But in 1940, all the available Merlins were needed for the unfolding fight for survival during the Battle of Britain. But even as the battle was unfolding, the Air Ministry relented and Chadwick got his Merlins. The Manchester was given four engines and an increase in wingspan from 80 feet to an eventual 102 feet. In January 1941, the new Manchester Mark III flew for the first time. Well, the first uh, thing we knew about the Lancaster was that one of our members came into lunch having done his night flying test on, on the Manchester and he said uh, you won't believe me fellas but I've just seen a Manchester with four engines and uh, this was the uh, prototype Lancaster which was really just a Manchester with four Merlins instead of two um, vultures uh, with six feet on each wingtip. Um, some of them had three rudders but uh, almost uh, at the same time the Manchesters adopted two rudders too so the, the aircraft looked exactly the same except for the slightly longer wingtip 
uh, wingspan and uh, the four engines. The balance of some 1,000 airframes originally ordered as Manchester's were now converted to the newly christened Lancaster. During the winter of 1941, the first production machines began rolling off the production lines. The first three aircraft were delivered to number 44 squadron on Christmas Eve 1941. Large-scale production was now underway at Avro's Chatterton factory and at Metropolitan Vickers factory at Castle Bromwich. The Lancaster was starting to roll and that really went in. The rhythm was terrific. These women came in, you know, and we're teaching them how to rivet. And in no time at all, they were knocking them off like shelling peas. It was, honestly, it was really marvellous the way they just took to it. Everybody had their own job, and my particular job at that time on Lancaster production was fitting engines and props. Now, as you know, East Lancaster had four engines, four props. I used to do 16 engines a day and 16 props. That's not counting the night shift for following you know. We'd come in in the morning in the aircraft, just the fuselage to be on the floor, ready for buttoning, buttoning up, as we call it at the end of the factory, and the factory's quarter of a mile in length and third of a mile wide. By five o'clock at night, that particular aircraft we were working on was up at the top hangar here, going through the doors ready for engine run. With all the other three, we had three lines to go at, you see. We had a production line of Metropolitan Vickers. They were doing Lancaster's in Trafford Park, but they came here for assembly. So you got a Metrovic line and you got two Avro lines. All putting them all together as they were rolling, there was 50 aircraft a week going out. The airfield was absolutely crammed jammed with them. You couldn't breathe for them, ready for going off into, you know, to the RAF. Not counting, all the way around the factory was all these Lancasters waiting to come in the factory for assembly. But the rhythm was absolutely, it never stopped. Now we were working 12 hours a day, seven days a week. As we finished, the night shift came in, and as they finished, we came in. So you can imagine what it was like, you know, absolutely terrific the way things rolled. <coughs> now, the engines, a lot of them were being shipped down from Scotland, and the lorries were coming in one behind the other. It was like a great big marshalling yard here at Woodford, seeing all these trucks coming with these lorries. And the far line, I had must have had about five or six hundred engines parked every day. As fast as we fitted them, lorries were bringing the replacements in to fit. There were also plans to build Lancasters in Canada at the Victory Aircraft Facility in Moulton, Ontario. The first British Lancasters were designated B-1s, while the Canadian aircraft were B-10s. The wings and fuselage were built in five sections, with all the required equipment fitted before final assembly. One of the main criteria for the Canadian-built Lancasters was the need for interchangeability of parts with British examples to avoid problems with servicing and maintenance. If you count engines and turrets as single items, there are still some 55,000 separate parts that go to make up a Lancaster. Britain already had a substantial aircraft industry and the manufacturing skills were not too hard to find. But the story in Canada was very different. A shortage of many of the skilled trades meant that they had no alternative but to train up their own. In two years, the workforce trebled Many of these tasks were taken on by women, who eventually made up some 25% of the workforce building Lancasters. Although the Canadian versions used American-made instrumentation, which was obviously easier to source, they were otherwise identical to their British counterparts. The demand for Rolls-Royce Merlin engines resulted in the American company Packard building Merlin engines under license. It was these engines that powered the Canadian Lancasters as well as British-built versions designated the B3. Indeed, it was a specially adapted version of the B3 that was used in arguably the most famous raid of the Second World War, the Dambuster Raid. The first Canadian Lancaster to be delivered to the RAF was KB700 and its progress through the factory to completion was a source of immense pride. The 
Yes, she was nearly ready for battle. And as we looked at that long, slender plane, we thought of all the work we'd put into it, the months of effort, and now the reward. Some had doubted that the thing could be done, but we knew we could do it. A Canadian job, needing only a Canadian crew. And there they were, right in our plant, everyone a veteran of more than 30 operational flights, some of them flown to Canada a few minutes after they returned from a raid on Europe. We got talking to those boys, and we made friends with them. They'd come together from the coast, the prairies, the east, to make up a crew, just as we'd come from all over Canada to make up a plane. And somehow, as we talked, the plane became a cross-section and symbol of all Canada. day before the plane was ready for its flight, we had a party at the plant, open house for everyone, the girls and fellas showing each other the job they'd done on the big ship. On August the 1st, 1943, KB-700 rolled off the assembly lines. It had been almost one year since they had received the Lancaster from Britain with which to make the patterns. Remember, this was to be our last contact with her. To us, she was a living thing. The aircraft was christened the Ruhr Express and was scheduled to join number six group in Bomber Command, which was almost entirely crewed by the Royal Canadian Air Force. A white Scottish Canadian, Saskatchewan born. They called him B for Bambi. unfolding below them like a map. Then, as the navigator set his course for England, the coast of the Maritimes gave way to the grey Atlantic. The boys kidded among themselves as they crossed the ice floes way out at sea. thousand feet over the Atlantic above the clouds. At dawn when the sun came out, they went down a few thousand feet to get warm. Then suddenly the meadows of old England, as gently they eased her down to journey's end. The pilot who made the inaugural flight was squadron leader Reg Lane who already held the DSO and DFC and had completed two operational tours. Not surprisingly, such a considerable contribution to the war effort was warmly welcomed when they arrived in Britain. They were back at their stations far down at 10 a.m. with 350 gallons of gas still left in their tanks to be welcomed by their senior officer overseas and by Canada's High Commissioner. 
Soon they heard Sir Stafford Cripps, Britain's Minister of Aircraft Production, telling them what England thought of their plane. Recently, we've received from the hands of the Canadian workers their first Lancaster bomber to be sent to this country. It's a magnificent plane, up to the highest standards of production and performance. We hope it's the first of a very long series, which will fly quickly to the aerodromes of this country and load up with bombs for Germany. Production at the Victory Aircraft Factory was to rise to one Lancaster a day. Sadly, however, KB-700 was not to survive the war. An hydraulic failure while landing back after her 49th mission on January 2, 1945, resulted in a crash that left her beyond repair. The irony was that she was due to return to Canada after her 50th mission as a memorial to Canadian air crews. Squadron leader Lane, however, did survive the war and retired from the Canadian Air Force as a Lieutenant General. But aircraft built in Canada was not the only solution to the problem of not enough aircraft. In an attempt to solve the shortages of engines, another version of the Lancaster was built using Bristol Hercules engines. As these were radial engines, their profile was completely different to the inline layout of the Merlin. Designated the B2, Armstrong Whitworth was awarded the contract to build these examples at their factory in Coventry. The first two examples were completed in September 1942, and although the type re-equipped several squadrons, it was never as successful as the Merlin-powered examples. It could not reach the same altitude, and it was slower. It also had to carry a reduced bomb load. The B-2 was discontinued after some 300 had been built. By the time the production of the Lancaster ceased on the 2nd of February 1946, 7,377 aircraft of all marks had been built. At least 59 Bomber Command squadrons were equipped with Lancasters and they flew over 156,000 sorties. With such a record, it seems extraordinary that there are just two flying examples left today, one in Canada and one operated by the Royal Air Force's Battle of Britain Memorial Flight or BBMF. PA-474 rolled off the production line at Chester in 1945 and was earmarked for service in the Far East as part of the RAF's Tiger Force. But the war with Japan ended before she could take part in hostilities and was reassigned to photo reconnaissance duties with No. 82 Squadron in South Africa. She then briefly became one of four Lancasters operated by flight refuelling as a tanker before PA-474 was transferred to the Royal College of Aeronautics. Here she was used for trials of laminar flow wings which were mounted vertically on the upper rear fuselage. In 1964, PA-474 was adopted by the Air Historical Branch for a proposed RAF museum at Hendon. But the following year she found herself rehomed at Waddington where restoration work began. Although there was still more work to be done, PA-474 was granted permission to fly regularly. Finally, with restoration work ongoing, PA-474 joined the BBMF. Since then, she has become a regular and eagerly anticipated participant at air shows. As she flies as a memorial to Bomber Command, PA-474 has flown in a number of different wartime paint schemes during her years of display service. Here she is in the scheme of WSJ Johnny Walker, an aircraft from No. 9 Squadron, which took part in the first attack of the Tirpitz, flying from Russia. More recently, following a major service beginning in the winter of 2006, PA-474 emerged in a new scheme, commemorating aircraft EE-139. Christened Phantom of the Ruhr, this aircraft flew over 120 operations while in the service of two squadrons, No. 100, and number 550. PA-474 is a reminder that over 50,000 men of Bomber Command lost their lives, 
and so for the crews who have flown her over the years, that is a weighty responsibility. Flight lift and Ed Straw, you have probably the best job in the Royal Air Force. I think I do actually, yes. Yes, I love flying the Lancaster. It's a great honour, great privilege. How come you find yourself in this beautiful building? It's the only Lancaster, is it not? It's the only flying Lancaster in Europe, yes. There is one that flies in Canada, but this is the only RAF flying Lancaster. Yes. So how come you, out of all the others, are the captain of the Lancaster? Uh, persistence, I think. I think they were, they've got fed up with me asking, and I just kept applying, and I think they let me in eventually. But I, I always wanted to fly this aeroplane. I was taken with it from an early age. I always came to see it at air shows as a, as a youngster. And when I joined the Air Force, uh, I always had the ambition of some, some way, somehow, flying the Lancaster. I was very fortunate it, it eventually happened. It must be, on many occasions, a very emotional thing to do, to be flying the Lancaster on such state occasions, air shows, and often veterans, no doubt, come to visit you. They do, and, and when I joined the flight, I thought that flying the Lancaster would be the best part of the job. But actually, the, the history of the Lancaster is such that a, a, a great part of the job is to meet the veterans, listen to their stories, hear what they've got to say, and hear how they operated this aeroplane. And it's very humbling to hear their stories. And that's what makes it so worthwhile to fly this aeroplane, because we feel that while we fly this Lancaster in front of the public, then the the sacrifices they made in Bomber Command will, will, will be remembered. But they're all so young, weren't they? They were high teens, yeah. low twenties. Yes. Yes, they wouldn't have had me on the crew in those days. I'm far too old. Um, they were from 17, in, in, as you say, in the low twenties. Um, I think if you were late twenties, you were considered an old man. It was an incredible achievement for a, a young bunch of men to take these Lancasters so far into Germany, so many Lancasters being built and of course mm. so few failed to return. Yeah, the, uh, the statistics are horrendous. Uh, as you know, the, they built 7,377 Lancasters and about 3,300 odd w were shot down. Uh, the statistics are, are just horrendous when you consider the seven men on each aeroplane um, and there's dates where they, they lost nearly a hundred aircraft in one night. It, it, it's hard to uh, come to terms with those figures today. But moving around inside the Lancaster is virtually impossible, sitting mm. on the ground, dressed in what we're dressed in. Yes. Then they would have had the big bulky furry yeah. jackets, the trousers, yeah. the boots, parachute. Yeah. It was built for a purpose, and its purpose was to carry as many bombs as possible. And as you've seen from getting in the aeroplane today, uh, there's not very much room for anything else. It's, it's, it had the biggest bomb bay of all the bombers, and it was completely uninterrupted. Uh, so the main spars were, ran above the bomb bay, which makes it very difficult to get in and, as you say, get out of. So unfortunately, uh, Lancaster crews took a heavy toll once they were, were hit by fighters or by flak. It was a very difficult aircraft to get out of. Now you fly this in daylight, yes. in good weather, yes. not in rain. No. This instrumentation, it's not a huge amount of instrumentation. To, to do everything they achieved. I'm very happy that they've, they've left the flight, the, the controls and the, uh, all the instruments exactly as they sh were and as they should be. Um, we have no, nothing added except from a, a modern radio which is hidden away and an IFF. But other than that, we have exactly the same instruments that they had in 1943-44. IFF being what? It, oh, it's just a, so for air traffic, so they give them a squawk so they can find us more easily on the radar. Display flying the Lancaster requires a crew of four. The pilot, co-pilot, navigator and flight engineer. In wartime this would have been seven, as there would have been a bomb aimer up front and two gunners in the top and rear turrets. But what has not changed is the need for calm professionalism of the ground crews, whose dedication to getting the job done is and always was so often overlooked. The air crew depended on their ground crew as much as they depend on each other in the crew. And our ground crew, that was one of the values of the wartime flying. Each aircraft had its own ground crew and air crew. And they worked together as a team. And our ground crew were always there to see us off. And they were always there to see us back. Um, they were a great group. And as long as you had that relationship between the ground and the air crews, that was more confidence, more confidence you had. I never felt that I wasn't going to come back. And I think that was um, probably subconscious 
confidence in Joe to start with, um, but also confidence in the ground crew, making sure that aeroplane would get there and get back again. And that was all part and parcel of the whole setup of that particular part of the war. Once all the pre-flight checks are completed, the engines are started in sequence. They are then run for several minutes to bring them up to the correct operating temperatures and pressures. Once the pilot is happy, the chocks are removed and the power checks carried out to ensure the engine's magnetos are operating correctly. If all are OK, some 15 tonnes of Lancaster begins to move, taxiing out to the runway. Manoeuvring a Lancaster on the ground requires deft use of brakes, engine power, as well as use of the rudder pedal to initiate turns. With the Lancaster lined up ready for takeoff, the pilot increases the power while holding the aircraft on the brakes. With four Merlins demanding to be unleashed, the pilot makes a final recheck of the engine instruments and looks at each engine before releasing his grip on the brake lever. As the aircraft surges forward, right rudder is needed to correct the Lancaster's tendency to swing left. In crosswinds, this will be even more pronounced, particularly as a tail dragger, the Lancaster will want to weathercock into wind. As power increases, the pilot pushes the control column forward to raise the tail. At 90 knots, or 103 miles an hour, the column is eased back and the Lancaster gently lifts off the runway. pilot will hold the aircraft in a shallow climb to around 1,000 feet before setting cruise speed at 150 knots, or 172 miles an hour. At this speed, the Lancaster will consume approximately 150 gallons of fuel an hour. The display often begins with the BBMF's classic three-ship formation flypast of the Lancaster flanked by two of the fighters, the Spitfires and Hurricanes. The fighters then display first, but with one minute to go before their segment ends, the Lancaster crew will be called in to begin their first flypast. The Lancaster is, of course, a priceless part of Britain's national heritage, and so the display manoeuvres are as gentle as possible. This ensures that the stresses on the airframe are as little as possible, so that the Lancaster's flying career will be as long as possible before any major overhaul is required. The gentleness of the display betrays the fact that the Lancaster could pull some spectacular manoeuvres when required during the war. Alex Henshaw was the legendary chief test pilot at Vickers Castle Bromwich Factory and his party piece was to actually barrel roll a Lancaster. I had a chief test pilot uh, on Lancasters that uh, came up with me and uh, the, the practice was that uh, from the die we dive to 370 pull the aircraft up into it, uh, up to that angle, well then you, it's either pitching forward, you had to do it fairly gently, otherwise the engines would cut, or do a steep turn. And as I did a steep turn, uh, the, the, this uh, pilot said, uh, Christ's sake, Chief, steady on, you'll have the bugger over. <laughs> and so I thought, well, why not, you see? And, uh, and this, this, the secret was, of course, you just couldn't roll it. You had to do it with a little bit of circumspect. And the, the way uh, it could be done was, to, I had my glove on the top of the instrument combing, and the secret was, was to keep this glove suspended in the air. So when you pulled up the negative G, if you were doing that on a roll, well, you could probably flick out. And of course, if you didn't uh, did it a reverse way, then all the engines were cut, and then of course you would uh, uh, with loss of power, uh, you'd, you'd flick out anyway, but if you could be done with the glove just being suspended in, 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 in mid-air, you were between positive and negative G, and the aircraft will roll over as gently as a, as, a, as a moth. In fact, I've done it so many times that with the check pilot once, he was standing up, I said, Vendor, over. He didn't really know what I was saying. I went over, and I'll never forget the look of his face. 
when he was looking at the at, the, at, the, at one minute of the ground, and it was up there, and his feet were gently gently coming on and off the off the ground, <laughs> gentle as a as a lamb. That was my first first trip at Castle Bromwich. Alex said to me, he said, Peter, he said, uh, I'd like you to come up with me in a Lancaster so that I can show you the normal procedures that we carry out in our testing. And then you'll, you'll know exactly what to do. So I said, yes, OK. So he said, I've got a Lancaster test. So I sat up front beside him and took off and uh, climbing up, full throttle, you know, or climbing, the climbing speed, engine pressures, temperatures, yes, they're all OK. We'll keep climbing. We get up to about 15,000 feet, checking the climb, continuing to check the climb on the way up. And uh, then we'll do a level run. All engines flat out. Give it time to build up speed, see if it'll build up to its required speed. Of course, these uh, Langsters uh, were only engines and airframes. They didn't have any gear on board, no guns or radios or anything. So the, a lightly uh, loaded Lancaster. Um, and so we then got up to 15,000 feet. He said, I'm going to do a level run now. Full throttles on each engine. Yes, engine pressures, temperatures, yes, all OK. The controls were OK. Um, we just let it speed build up, see if it gets up to what we want, which it did. And he said, we've got one more thing to do. We've got to put it into a dive uh, to test, to see what the upfloat on the ailerons is. You know the ailerons. On the inside edge of each ailerons was a little line painted. And if it came up above that, then it, was, uh, it failed the test. So we put it, oh, Alex put it into a dive. And it got up to 390 on a lank, which is quite a high speed for a lank. And he said, no, this one's OK. The upfloat on the air was is fine. So we'll just pull up now and lose our bit of height. And uh, then we'll go back. So he pulled up. Next thing is, I was sitting beside him. We went round and we did an upward barrel roll in the lank. I thought, what the bloody hell's he done? Because <laughs> I'd never flown in a lank before anyway. And uh, so did this upward barrel roll, just to lose a bit of height, lose a, or didn't, not gain height, but lose a bit of speed. And then we eventually returned to uh, Castle Bromwich. But when I tell, I used to tell some of the bomber chaps about this, they could hardly believe it. Of course, they, don't forget, the aircraft they were flying was heavily laden with uh, uh, all the equipment they had to carry, the radio equipment and this and that and the other. Today's Lancaster pilot has one other manoeuvre to perform before the end. Show the crowds the bomb bay. Even at 300 feet, it's easy to see just how enormous the bomb bay is, which is why the Lancaster proved itself to be so versatile. Typically, it could carry 14,000 pounds of bombs, double the load of a B-17. But by the end of the war, it was carrying the gargantuan 10-ton Grand Slam earthquake bomb. It was a very powerful aircraft, a very powerful aircraft. And to me it was very impressive because of its bomb load. I mean, you know, the thing could haul, it didn't in my day, because the biggest actual bomb I ever carried was an 8,000 pounder. But I mean, then came the 12,000 pounder and eventually the 22,000 pounder. Now, I mean, any aircraft in those days that could carry a 10 ton bomb was an aircraft to be reckoned with. The Lancaster was a wonderful workhorse was fine to fly with. What I did notice on release was that we um, rose very rapidly several hundred feet in the air. Uh, my flight engineer said that he also heard a loud bang, but I don't, I never heard it, but he said he did. But all I felt was this tremendous jump <laughs> in the air. Well, I, I re had occasion to look up my logbook recently and I think the highest the height I bombed from was 24,500 feet and 
the Lancaster could achieve those heights, 20,000, 22,000 was commonplace bombing when I was on 97 squadron. Uh, and of course, uh, we would try and gain height after having bombed uh, to climb as high as possible to get up above the range of fighters. And I know, again, from my, I noticed from my logbook that uh, I think the highest, well, no, it's not from my logbook, but from memory, uh, 28 and a half thousand feet was before, we, before it started to struggle. So quite often we'd come back at that height, 28, 28 and a half thousand feet. Uh, you know, it demonstrates its ability as an all range aircraft again. And it was, uh, never had any problem taking off with heavy bomb load. Uh, the power of the four Merlins was, was quite significant and uh, a major factor in the performance of the Lancaster during the war. The BBMF display always finishes with one more formation fly past, a moving salute to the 55,573 aircrew who didn't make it back. The Lancaster made its operational debut on the 3rd of March 1942, when four aircraft of number 44 squadron were sent off in a mine-laying sortie off Heligoland Bight in the North Sea. All returned safely, and a week later Lancasters took part in their first night bombing raid on Essen. The arrival of the Lancaster in service coincided with the appointment of Air Marshal Arthur Harris as overall chief of Bomber Command. He was determined to pursue an aggressive bombing campaign against Germany, and in the Lancaster, he had the aircraft with which to do it. The Nazis entered this war under a rather childish delusion that they were going to bomb everybody else, and nobody was going to bomb them. At Rotterdam, London, Warsaw, and half a hundred other places, they put that rather naive theory into operation. They sowed the wind, and now they are going to reap the whirlwind. Let the Nazis take good note of the western horizon. There they will see a cloud as yet no bigger than a man's hand. But behind that cloud lies the whole massive power of the United States of America. When the storm bursts over Germany, they will look back to the days of Lubeck and Rostock and Cologne, as a man caught in the blasts of a hurricane will look back to the gentles or zephyrs of last summer. It may take a year, it may take two, but for the Nazis, the writing is on the wall. Let them look out for themselves. The cure is in their own hands. There are a lot of people who say that bombing can never win a war? Well, my answer to that is that it has never been tried yet, and we shall see. Germany, clinging more and more desperately to her widespread conquests, and even seeking foolishly for more, will make a most interesting initial experiment. Japan will provide the confirmation. Lancasters were quickly accepted into squadron service, proving themselves to be sound and reliable workhorses. Many Lancaster raids would make headline news and several have become enshrined in British culture. The first Lancaster operation to make the news was a raid by 44 and 97 squadrons on the MAN diesel factory at Augsburg in southern Germany. Not only was it to be one of the furthest raids yet mounted by Bomber Command, it was also the Lancaster's first daylight operation. We went into uh, the briefing room and uh, saw the usual tape from base to the target, uh, which stretched all the way down to southern Germany. And everybody roared with laughter. Obviously, they're pulling our legs, you know. Uh, and that was the first uh, long raid. Um, and uh, the first daylight, too, with the Lancaster. So uh, when they convinced us that they were serious, uh, we all wrote our little letters of goodbye to our families and uh, went to lunch and that was that. 
I, I had a certain amount of uh, luck on my side because I, I was only the uh, reserve. We were sending six aircraft from 97 and six from uh, 44 Squadron. And uh, I was the seventh on, on, uh, on uh, 97. Uh, but we carried on and uh, we had a lunch and uh, did the briefing and went out to the aircraft so on and so forth. And uh, we got into the aircraft and my wireless op said, you know, Skipper, having done all this, it's a pity we're not going with them, isn't it? So I said, don't you dare talk like that. And uh, just at that moment, uh, Warrant Officer Harrison's uh, Lancaster on the next uh, hard standing was starting up. And I noticed he's having a, a bit of trouble with number one engine. And uh, eventually he shut down all engines, so I, I knew that uh, we were no longer a reserve. One thing I learned, or I hope everybody learned, was that it was no good bombing in Vic formation if your Vic was wider than the target. In fact, um, I was on the right-hand side of our Vic, and I just couldn't get far enough in. My bomb aimer was saying, left, left, left. And I had another wingtip here, so I just couldn't get any closer. And uh, foolishly, I said, well, tell me, give me a couple of seconds, and I'll bank to the right and try to throw the bombs in a bit. And uh, it unfortunately didn't work because I've seen uh, photographs of the bomb holes since then and right alongside the wall of the assembly shed, which was our main aiming point, there were six bomb holes, perfect straight line, but about a yard uh, off, off the line. Uh, the leader of our formation, uh, Flap Sherwood, um, he was just on my left, as I said, and um, as we fled from the target after dropping our bombs at about 20 feet, right on the ground, I could see shells bouncing on the ground as the, they were firing at our retreating forms, and I noticed that uh, there was a, a stream of what looked like steam coming out of Sherwood's aircraft, or out of the port wing, which suddenly turned black. And I realized he, he was on fire. Despite the loss of 12 aircraft, Lancasters were quickly re-equipping Bomber Command squadrons. On the night of May the 30th, 1942, the first spectacularly large attack was mounted. Just over a thousand bombers, Lancasters, Stirlings, Wellingtons, everything that Bomber Command could lay its hands on were assembled into a force to strike at Cologne in an operation codenamed Operation Millennium. Of the 1,047 aircraft that took part, 868 reached their target. What arguably stunned the Germans more than the sheer number of bombs dropped that night was the realization that Britain could muster such a large force. Throughout 1942, Bomber Command was able to increase the pressure on Germany's infrastructure as more and more Lancasters arrived. Night after night, and in all weathers, the crews settled into a routine of briefings, preparation and operations. One tour was 30 ops. A uh, briefing was fit, ran along fairly normal lines, obviously. You were told the target, you did the planning, the winds, the anti-aircraft you could fire, you could expect, any fighters you could, that you might expect, and so on. Um, and then you went, the, we went ahead, that was a general briefing, and then bomb aimers went for their briefing, navigators went for theirs, the gunners and so on, the bomb, and you went to, usually with your navigator, you went into briefing, and, he did the plotting and the courses and you watched him and talked it over together. And then you 
either went out to the airplane or waited or went back when normally I beg your pardon you normally went back for a meal a flying meal which was always the same was delicious remember there was rationing in those days but we were always very well fed um, and then you waited for the transport to take you out to the aircraft and I suppose waiting for either a flare to go up from the air traffic control so, so you could get in and start up waiting there on the grass beside the aircraft that was probably the the most taxing time and it might be a very cold winter's night or a very bright summer's day but that was once you got into the aeroplane you had things to do and you settled down and really settled down you just sort of what just bore out what you had to do and that was it you just went ahead and did it cabin service wasn't very good but i mean we were always you always had you were issued before you took off a, a bar of nutty and uh, money, German money, and um, a flask of coffee. In fact, uh, in the Lancaster book, it gives the requirements for a thousand bomber raid, and it's absolutely staggering the amount of organisation that went into, into putting up a thousand aircraft. I suppose at that stage, where are we? We're in... Uh, getting towards the end of uh, 42 and we're still basically mainly on um, Ruhr attacks known as the Happy Valley in those days and it was a question of going into briefing each day and the same target would come up it would be the Ruhr Valley, Essen, Dusseldorf, Dortmund, wherever and <clears throat> it was always the same sight oh Christ not again but um, we went on these and uh, various other trips, Munich, we did Munich, um, we did um, a couple of um, uh, daylights to, or semi-daylights to uh, Italy and then landed in North Africa and bombed Italy on the way back again. The Ruhr was always recognised as being heavily defended and uh, that was one of the concerns I think. Um, probably shooting ahead a little bit here, but that was one of the concerns when we saw the targets for the dams right up on the map, was that, that the routes led through the Ruhr and it was recognised heavily defended area and uh, with large concentration of flak. So it was, the Ruhr was not, not a happy hunting ground for bomber crews. I mean, the first trip we did to Spezia was a low, low flying uh, run across France at about 500 feet. Um, and it was in, in the uh, early spring, or late spring and early summer, and it was most exhilarating because as we went, fled, went across France, because we were going to climb over the Alps and go down from the Alps, um, although we came back uh, uh, across the Bay of Genoa, um, this approach, of course, was meant to disguise where we were going. All the, the uh, French villagers opened their doors and came out and waved and, there were about 50 lengths thundering across France at 500 feet. It was, it was quite an exhilarating experience. Well, I wouldn't say wild away. Once you're over enemy territory, you can't sort of sit back. Um, and night trips particularly, you, you don't know if you're going to get jumped or not by a night fighter. I mean, just talking about Stettin, the old plant, the old reviving plant there was... Um, a very, quite a long way. It was about a six, six and a quarter hour trip, I think, all at night. Um, it was, um, well, you're on the lookout, everybody is. I, you don't while away the time, you can't daydream or. It was noisy. It was sometimes smelly. Um, but the bombing compartment was probably the most comfortable place in the aircraft. But it was such a bloody reliable aeroplane. We never had any doubt about the aeroplane bringing us back, provided it didn't get shot up or whatever, damaged in, in, uh, in, uh, in action, as it were. In the, in the front end of a lank, it was fairly comfortable. I mean, it wasn't like the mid-upper turret was a bit, um, was a bit cramped, and so was the, uh, the rear turret. But um, the bomb aiming, the bomb aimer's compartment was forward and just below the, um, the pilot. And so you had plenty of room. I mean, I had my one, my first bomber command trip 
was the hairiest because we we we, we bombed San Nazaire and as we were coming away we were engaged by a night fighter and when you lay down in the bombing position your feet are braced against the end of the bombing the bombing the bomb bay underneath the pilot and as I lay there as the aircraft was being thrown about I could feel a thud on on the on the um, end of the bomb bay so when we finally settled down and got a bit more level flying after we'd lost the night fighter I looked switched on the light in the in and looked through the inspection hatch just in time to see a thousand pound bomb come sliding down and finish up with a dull thud right under my nose at the end of the of the of the bomb bay and I called out to the sea to the I said skipper we've got a loose bomb in the bomb bay well now the skipper was just going to say or said open bomb doors but the flight engineer beat him to it he said bomb doors opening skipper and so this bomb fell out somewhere over over Brittany or somewhere like that icing up did affect the uh, the uh, release systems on the bombs and I, on one case I think I had the whole bomb laid hang, hang up until uh, we got back to the North Sea and uh, another on one occasion uh, we uh, we, were, we came to a separate occasion, a, a five, we could hear a 500 pounder rolling around in the bomb bay and of course the bomb, the, the bomb, bar, the doors themselves would, would freeze up and it wasn't until we're down long enough at low level for the, the ice <coughs> to melt for the bomb base to be able to open and uh, we'd be able to drop the, uh, or jettison whatever bombs had, had not been released over the target. One occasion, uh, I reached back, I got back to Woodhall, this is still, still 97 I think, um, where I, uh, one of the practices, normal practice was when you're taxiing around the runway, the taxiway rather, it's a, the perimeter track to back to your marshalling point. Uh, I opened the bomb doors, you, you, you opened your bomb bay doors before you got to your, your tarmac properly. And on this occasion, a uh, half a dozen Incendiaries dropped out onto the perimeter track and caught immediately caught fire. That was a, another. That was a, an indication of what might happen when you get iced up. I suppose twofold. There was always the danger of fighters. Again, we were extremely lucky. We never saw one. And then there was the danger of the defences at the um, the target. And some were not so lucky as others. I never did see an aeroplane being blown up over the target, but other people, I've read of other people saying, yes, they saw this happen. Um, we were only hit once, and that was on a Berlin uh, trip. And uh, we were hit in the port outer engine. And so that was feathered, and that was it. And we were flying home on the three without any difficulty, but then the port inner decided it had had enough and so that too was feathered and Joe needed to fly it on the two starboard engines. I know you can trim for some of these things but you can't trim it all out you've got to fly the ruddy thing and he flew it back we were not too far away from the the enemy coast when it happened and so he flew it back and as we approached the English coast he called Mayday and Tangme had picked us up and it's the only time ever that Joe said crash positions, which meant I'd got to get out of the nose, which I, I wasn't in the habit of doing. But it meant going back to the main spa, sitting down with your back on the main spa. Again, because he wasn't sure how the aircraft was going to react when it landed. And for that same reason, instead of landing on the runway, he landed to the right of the runway so that if the aircraft did in fact crumble up or whatever, it wasn't going to block the wrong way for other aircraft. Only occasionally was I caught with searchlights. Ever caught, the, the problem with the searchlights was if one, one uh, battery of searchlights caught a plane in its, uh, in its sights and illuminated it, the, the German uh, searchlight batteries tended to focus on that and you'd get a and they had, you had a great deal of difficulty escaping that. But I never had any, I don't, I probably once or twice, probably, they'd flick past you and before, 
And if you took quick evasive action, you wouldn't uh, be caught again. But I don't really, I don't think I was ever coned by a number of searchlights. On the route out, you manned the front turret. Then you got into the uh, bomb bay as you were approaching the target. You fused, selected the bombs and set your distributor to wherever it needed to be set. And you switched on your bomb site. And as you, people often say to me, were you ever frightened? And I said, well, let me put it to you this way. I'm lying in the front of the aircraft. And long before we get there, I can see all that gunge that we've got to go into. I think anybody that wasn't a little bit apprehensive at that stage is either lacking in emotion or else a stranger to the truth. Uh, the danger points of a, of a bombing raid was while you're on that straight, tail, uh, that straight course over the target. Once you got, or once we got into the target area, my concentration was on the bomb site and getting the bombs in the right place. It wasn't easy in the early stages because the, the Mark 14 bomb site wasn't the most accurate of, of instruments, but it was the only one we had. And you were concentrating. It was my job to drop the bombs, so I was concentrating on the job that I was doing. I was unaware of what was going on round about me, and I was directing the pilot to whichever way I wanted him to go. The standard bombing jargon was left, left, steady, right, steady. And as long as it was steady for a while, bomb's gone. In July 1942, the United States Army Air Force joined the fray with the 8th Air Force launching daylight raids from their bases in East Anglia and Cambridge. American doctrine may have been completely different to bomber commands, but even American crews were impressed by Lancaster's capabilities. The seer of the aircraft was a Captain O'Brien. And we took off, but just before I left, Gibson said, I'm just going to take a lank up for, for um, an air test for tonight. He said, I'll, I'll come and form eight on you. And so we took off the Liberator, and all of a sudden this lank came right close up. And the, the Americans said, ah, oh, you guys are, are used to formation flying. And I said, good God, no, we fly independently at night. Ooh, all panic on the bloody cockpit. And all of course they didn't like they didn't like the idea of people not used to close flying, although with their own people, you know. Anyway, all of a sudden, we were doing about 200 knots, I suppose, and all of a sudden, Gibson opened the taps and this thing went up in a climbing turn and turned away. And all the Americans said, "Jesus!" It was a tremendous demonstration of of, of power, and speed. It really was terrific. But for all the countless sorties flown by Lancaster crews during the war, there is one that remains one of the greatest, most daring feat of arms of all time, the Dam's Raid. The attack was led by Wing Commander Guy Gibson, who was already a national hero. Volunteers were called for to form a new squadron for a special operation. That's all we knew. I suppose the next surprise was knowing that it was going to be low-level flying. That was great. Having been at 10, 12, maybe 15, occasionally, um, and sometimes at a push, um, and then the, the prescribed height was going to be 100 feet. Well, hey! For me, lying in the front, that was absolutely exhilarating. Just lying there and watching the old ground going woof, 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 straight past. The exhilaration of low flying 220 miles is great, and uh, you, you've got, providing you can become competent at uh, gauging how far ahead obstacles are and being able to pull up to clear them. Then the squadron began receiving highly modified Lancaster B-3s. The aircraft had been modified to carry a mine that had been designed by the highly respected aviation designer, Sir Barnes Wallace. Then the aircraft arrived, and the first question was, was, do those bloody things fly? Because they'd lost their mid-upper turret, they'd lost their bomb bay as such, and they'd just got these two arms sticking down 
just be, it, behind the no, just behind the nose. God, what's that? And one of them got a wheel on it. What the hell are these things about? And then the bombs arrived, and they were just glorified dustbins. And then it became obvious that those arms were going to carry those two bombs. That was one thing that we were able to work out for ourselves. Twelve aircraft took place on the trials of the inert bombs and uh, what, over the 11th, 12th, 13th of May. Uh, and six of those were badly da were damaged through splash from flak. I was one of the guilty ones and uh, I can't remember uh, whether I was too low or too high. We undertook cross-country flights almost daily. Uh, and, and what, three, four hour flights, most of them incorporated uh, uh, flying over the Derwent Water or the Uppingham Reservoir and one or two subsidiary dams that I don't ever remember from that some of the, some of the others flew over, but I didn't. I do remember quite well, vividly uh, or quite clearly the times I flew over the Derwent Water and, uh, and then we'd go north and I'd come down the North Sea and home that way. Then there was a question of uh, what we were going, how we were going to do our exercises. Um, all navigation had to be by map, by map reading. Um, and the bomb aimer and the navigator would each have their own maps. The nav would suggest what we were supposed to be looking for. I would be looking for it. If I could see it, that was it. If I couldn't, I would look for something else that I thought was an equal uh, pinpoint and he was be able to adjust according to that. Some crews, when the, the route was uh, drawn in on the map, they cut it down to just either side of that, uh, that route and put it on a roller, so that they unrolled it as they went along. The concentration was on not only the pilot low flying, but concentration, there was a, uh, our concentration was, was uh, on, on all members of the crew being able to on visual navigation, undertake visual navigation, and be able to identify targets that, while approaching them at low level and, and at 220 to 30 miles per hour. The other peculiar thing was that we had to make our own bomb sites. And the bomb site consisted of a triangle of plywood with a pin in each of the uh, corners. <coughs> there had to be a specific distance between the two in the base uh, pins. There had to be a specific distance from the middle of those two to the apex pin. Why? God only knows. And then poles were set up the target area, which was Wainfleet bombing range. And they were set up at a particular distance. And the idea was that you put the one pin to your eye and you flew, directed the aircraft to bring the two pins in line with these two posts and then you dropped your bomb. We used practice bombs for that. They were plotted by the uh, range staff and when they came back, if they were anything other than very close to the right place, you were in a bit of a lumber. You had to explain why it had happened and get out and do some more, but quick. We'd now discovered that on the Saturday night before the actual raid, Barnes Wallace showed us the, the film of his development of the, the bouncing bomb. And so we learnt then that that wheel on the edge there was attached by a belt from it, went back into that bit of the bomb bay to a little Jap engine in there, and that was going to resolve, revolve the, the, the bomb backwards. It had to be backwards. Uh, I, I think I remember the first time that we, when that would have been on that test drop, we spun it at, uh, at five, 500 revs a minute. Uh, and, and that really had a major effect on, well not major, but it had certainly had an effect on because you could feel the, the, you feel the, 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 the effect of 9,250 pounds revolving and it had caused a juddering effect. It did affect lift to a certain extent, uh, but on the whole the Lancaster coped with it pretty well. Then there was a question of calculating the exact 60 feet and this is where the lights were introduced, um, situated uh, underneath the aircraft, angled so that they 
converged at exactly 60 feet. That had been calculated, I think, by the, the boffins at um, Farnborough, REE at Farnborough. And so that was, the, that was the set for it. And so the operation became very much a team work. The navigator looked through the, the perspex at the side of the aircraft, looking at the lights. He gave directions up and down to make until those uh, lights were uh, uh, coincident. The flight engineer was calling out the speed because the I think the speed was something like 220 knots, uh, ground speed 220 knots, something like that, I think. Um, so he was calling out the speed and the bomb aimer was giving directions. So the pilot was having to do very much as he was told. Um, it worked, but it was entirely, and of course, during that time, the gunners were buzzing around. And because we'd lost the mid-upper turret, the mid-upper gunner was flying in the front turret. Fortunately, he'd got a pair of stirrups fitted, so he wasn't kicking me in the head all the time. The conjecture then was that it was going to be one of uh, the big German battleships, probably mostly the Tirpitz. How long can you get? Three o'clock the next afternoon, Sunday afternoon, Tannoy, all 617 squadron to the operations room. Here we went. And then we saw these models of the Duns. They had the Moan and the Zorp there, but they hadn't been able to finish the Ada in time. When we walked into the uh, briefing room and saw the target, uh, I think, as I said earlier, the, uh, the main concern was the fact that the routes in led over the, through the, up the Ruhr Valley. And that, most of us all were aware that that was a, probably the heaviest defended area in, in Germany. And that was the concern rather than the, the, any concern that may have been raised by the fact that we're bombing, going to bomb dams and not, a, not a buildings and infrastructure such as that. Originally, there were five aircraft each, uh, briefed for that particular. And the thing that I suppose to some degree disappointed us, that all that training, bombing training we'd done, we weren't going to use. Because with the Zorpa, A, it had no towers, so we had nothing to sight on, and B, it was so placed within the hills that you couldn't make a head-on attack anyway. And so we were briefed that we had to fly down one side of the hills, level out with the port outer engine over the dam itself, so that you were on the water side, just on the water side of the, dam, of the dam, and estimate. We weren't spinning the bomb at all, it was an inert drop. Estimate as nearly as you could to the centre of the dam to drop the, the, the bomb. That was the briefing. Well, I was uh, one of five aircraft that were flying due east from Lincolnshire uh, to a spot above the island of Veelan. The first day, first nine aircraft led by Gibson went further south. I turned at our turning point, I turned down the wind and approached the island of Veland, and I could see the breakers as I approached the island. I could see the breakers ahead breaking on the foreshore and see the, 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 the sand dunes above the level of the sea. And I gained a certain amount of height just to clear them. I must have been flying, I think I was flying pretty low, pretty low, about 30 or 40 feet or something like that. And uh, I flew to be on the safe side and cleared the was clear had actually cleared the top of the dunes and was losing height on the other side. Uh, when I the line of tracer appeared on the left port side and was hit by one one shell on the amidships on the on the on the link, which cut all the communication and uh, inter electrical systems and. When everything went dead, I asked the, uh, I carried on and asked the wireless operator uh, if he would inspect the damage and see whether it could be repaired. In the meantime, I was circling around in the in the Zeta Z, and uh, when he came back and said no, uh, we at that stage we we're communicating by lifting the flaps of our flying of helmets. Uh, it was the only way we could converse, yelling in each other's ears. And when he came back and said, no, it couldn't be repaired. I made the decision that uh, to return to base. And it was going to be, because it was absolutely essential, navigation would have been extremely difficult without 
being able to communicate with the navigator and with the crew being able to identify targets. And even if we'd got to the target, uh, how would the uh, bomber have been able to direct, the, direct me as pilot on the run up to the dam for? So I believe I had no alternative and, uh, and reluctantly made the decision to go back and had the dubious distinction of landing, the first one to land with a live bomb on, live, live, live upkeep, yeah. Joe opened up the taps a little bit, so we tried to make up as much time as we could. And as we were going, approaching the, the um, islands going in, he said he sensed that the gunners would hear the aircraft, they'd recognise the noise of the aircraft, and so they'd be gunning straight away. And he could see these two sand dunes so he went down in between them to avoid the, the, uh, the uh, flag. And we were toddling along just south of Ham. And this goods train was coming up at right angles, toddling along there. And Joe Batson in the front turret said, can I have a go, Joe? And I think reluctantly so, Joe said, oh yes, okay. And so Ron opened up with these little 303s in the front turret. What we didn't know, it wasn't just a goods train, it was an armoured goods train, and it replied with rather more than 303s. We knew we'd been hit. We felt it, we heard it, and we felt it. But nothing seemed to happen as far as the aircraft was concerned, so we just pressed on. We eventually found the Zorp, but it was a bit difficult, because as we were approaching it, the mist was beginning to develop, and it was a bit difficult to find until we actually did find it. Once we got to the target, it was absolutely clear, brilliant moonlight. And then we saw what we had, we'd really supposed to do. And what they hadn't told us at briefing was that there was a church steeple on the side of the hill that were from which we were supposed to attack. So what did we do? Did you get down low and lift a wing to get over that? Or Joe said, not likely. He said, we'll use that as a marker and then we'll go down from there get down to 60 if we can. Um, well, doing that and getting the aircraft in the right, exactly right position was more than a little bit difficult. If I wasn't satisfied, I called Dummy Ron and we went round again. If Joe wasn't satisfied, he just pulled away and left me to call Dummy Ron and away we went round again. And it took us actually 10 runs to get it right, but on the 10th run, uh, I dropped, I said, bomb gone from the rear turret, thank Christ. And so up we went to avoid hitting the hills on the other side. So we couldn't see, Joe and I couldn't see what the explosion was like, but Dave could in the rear turret. And these um, bombs, mines, or whichever they like, would like to be considered, were fused to ex uh, explode at a depth of 25 feet. So it was going to roll down, just hit the edge of the dam to roll it down and at 25 feet it would up. The bombs themselves weighed a total of 9,000 plus pounds of which 6,500 pounds was explosive. So when that goes off at 25 foot depth it's going to move a hell of a lot of water and um, Dave said he reckoned that water went up to a height of about a thousand feet. Although two of the dams were breached, the Lancaster force paid a high price. Eight aircraft were lost with 56 aircrew. Of those, only three survived to become prisoners of war. For those who made it back, there were royal receptions and decorations, including a Victoria Cross for Guy Gibson. But once the adulation had died down, there remained the question of what to do with such a highly trained unit. It wasn't until Cheshire took over that we got more au fait with uh, what the our role was going to be. I mean, we'd, uh, uh, we were not aware that we had, uh, there'd been any specific designs for our role by uh, group headquarters or anything like that. But uh, in the first couple of raids, I think, uh, under Cheshire, uh, it, was, it was felt that, that the marking uh, of uh, illumination of a target of the marking by PFM wasn't quite satisfactory for our point of view, or for the squadron's point of view, and Cheshire and Mickey Martin 
said, right, let's mark them ourselves at low level. No. So we're marking, low, marking targets at low level with Lancaster's. And uh, it was felt that the lank was a bit too cumbersome for low level marking, that sort of thing, uh, maneuverable. So Cheshire did, uh, persuaded the troop to give them four mosquitoes, so they marked them more mosquitoes. We, we, our role then was almost entirely on attacking specific targets uh, on our own without any help from uh, PFF or anything else. And uh, so that, right till the end of the war, I think our role was. The 617 role was, was Pacific targets rather than blanket bombing. Another famous mission for number 617 squadron came in September 1944. Their target was one of the German Navy's most powerful battleships, the Tirpitz. A joint force of Lancasters from number 617 and 9 squadrons was to attack and sink the Tirpitz using another Barnes Wallace designed bomb, the 12,000 pound tall boy. One of the great things about the tall boy and the Grand Slam was that um, if it got hit by flak, it had such a great big thick shell on it that it, it took the shell, flak and not you. So it was a protection and it was safe to land with, whereas if you had a cookie on board, um, that's the 4,000 pounders, that was very dangerous to land with because if for any reason you detonate, any reason at all, a hard landing or it dropped or something, everything went up. But reaching the Tirpitz was going to be difficult as she was sheltering in a Norwegian fjord up in the Arctic Circle. The whole of the inside of the fuselage was one massive fuel tank, well, two fuel tanks actually. They put up a smoke screen and we couldn't see the target very well anyhow and so it wasn't, we had to see the target to bomb it accurately with our bomb site, with the SABS bomb site. And that was the reason we knew that although we got back, that um, we hadn't done the damage it had, that we hoped to have done, yes. It was tiring, but we never seemed to notice it. The only time I did was um, after the Tirpitz trip. I needed to sleep. Thirteen and a quarter hours in, in one seat is, <laughs> is quite a long time. Tirpitz was hit and sunk during the third attempt. The bulge under the rear fuselage is the housing for the H2S radar navigation system. This system enabled aircraft to reach targets at night and in bad weather using radio waves to map the ground. The system had been first used in Lancasters during the raids on Hamburg in July 1943. During the Battle of Berlin, which began in November, the improved Mark III version proved invaluable in locating the city, which was beyond the range of the navigation aids G and Oboe. The success of the 12,000-pound tall boy in raids like the Tirpitz led to the development of an even bigger earthquake bomb, the 22,000-pound Grand Slam. We didn't often carry 1,000 pounds. We normally carried a tall boy, which was 12,000 pounds, and a few, some of us were lucky enough to carry the uh, Grand Slam, which was 22,000 pounds, that's 10, 10 tons of bomb. And the Lancaster, which certainly wasn't designed for that, flew it, it had, uh, I think the bomb bay was modified slightly, and the undercarriage, I think we had Lincoln undercarriages, if I remember correctly, and it just did the job. It was wonderful. A superb aeroplane. The Lancaster could only carry a single Grand Slam slung underneath the modified bomb bay. On March the 15th, 1945, number 617 squadron bombed the Bielefeld fire duct with the first Grand Slam. At a very small target, if you take a very narrow and, and short, I can't remember how many times I went back, I think perhaps twice. But we hope we got it, yes. I mean, obviously, but our reputation depending. But it, it wasn't our fault always. There was, if there was, as I said before, if there were cloud cover, you didn't drop the bomb, you, did, you brought it back. Bomber Command kept up attacks right up until the last weeks of the war. Much of Germany's industrial heartland and rail networks lay in ruins. On April the 25th, crews from number 617 squadron were briefed to bomb Hitler's Bavarian retreat, Berchtesgaden. I expected far more opposition than there was, at being the place that it was, I thought there'd be, but, um, we bombed it, um, and there was some, obviously, opposition, but uh, it wasn't as much as I, as I thought there might be. This was right at the end of the war, so possibly they weren't able to muster 
as much, but I thought there would be even more because it was, after all, Hitler's eagle's nest, as he called it, or it was called. Four days later, on the 29th, Lancasters began flying the first of 3,298 sorties to drop food over Western Holland, where the civilian population was starving to death. Some 70,000 British prisoners of war were also repatriated in Lancasters during the last days of war. Lancasters continued in RAF service up until 1950, serving alongside the more powerful Avro Lincoln. A civilian airliner was also developed, called the Lancastrian, and then later the Avro York. Four Lancasters were also acquired by flight refuelling to be used as tankers and receivers in the development of in-flight refuelling. This capability was to greatly extend the range of bombers in the future. The tanker aircraft also took part in the epic Berlin airlift, which began in 1958. The tankers flew 750 sorties in the effort to break the Soviet blockade in what was the first major confrontation of the Cold War. Another development of the Lancaster, which was to play a vital role during the Cold War, was the Avro Shackleton. Shackleton served as long-range maritime patrol aircraft for the Royal Air Force right up until 1992, after the Cold War was over. But it is for its role in the Second World War that the Lancaster will always be remembered. The countless operations, the spectacular special missions, and the sacrifice and courage of her crews. It is because of these things that PA-474 of the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight remains such a potent symbol. It's a role she will continue to perform well into the 21st century, as the voices of the men who flew them fade into history.